go. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and, and as I have agreed with the organizers, I will not talk about uh, regulation or policy uh, this evening. I will talk about how we integrate renewable energy in the Faroe Islands. Um, my name is Terry Nilsen. I've been in the company or the utility here in the Faroes for 25 years, and I hold an engineering degree in electrical engineering in from, from Denmark and an MBA from Germany um, with focus on renewable energy. And uh, I will, for the next approximately 25 minutes, uh, try to explain what we do in order to achieve this rather ambitious goal to become 100% green in terms of electricity onshore by 2030 already. And obviously, I will be happy to take some questions afterwards, and I will share the slides as well. Okay? Uh, the agenda for today or this evening is uh, a few facts about the Faroe Islands and the Faroe's power system. I will say a few words about the, the projected energy consumption and uh, some of the renewable energy projects that we're looking into uh, these days. A few words about short and long term energy storage and then uh, a really important um, um, topic, at least to us, as an isolated power system, uh, integrating um, variable uh, inverter-based uh, technologies is to ensure the stability in the, in the power system. And then finally, I will have two slides about how we see um, the energy situation after 2030, which is very much in focus currently to us. But there is a, definitely a day and even more aggressive uh, energy uh, consumption after 2030. Um, if you take a look at the Faroe Islands, we are situated off in the North Atlantic between Norway, Iceland, and uh, Scotland, a group of 18 small islands. We are 54,500 inhabitants, and the land area is 1,400 square kilometers, but the economic zone around the islands is 261,000 square kilometers. So it's a rather big area. We have our own language and very high or ambitious renewable energy targets as we had for 100% green electricity by 2030, as already mentioned, but also carbon neutrality by 2050. If we look at the projected energy consumption in the upcoming years toward 2030, um, we see a huge growth in the um, in the demand. Uh, we have this what we normally say traditional demand. It is from households, industry, etc. But we incentivize people also to change their uh, heating. We have normally uh, oil burners uh, in domestic house or in our households, and we incentivize people to change to uh, heat pumps. And we do as well incentivize people to change their uh, internal combustion engines in cars to EVs. So that should be on top of the traditional uh, demand. And finally, we also, or we see that in the industry, which is currently using a lot of heavy fuel oil for process heating, they would like to change their means of heating to electricity as well. And as I said, we would like, or we are heading for at least that this should be green by 2030. However, we are blessed with really good renewable resources in the islands. We have average wind speeds exceeding 10 meters per second. We have some sun, not so much, but uh, at least in the summer months where we have daylight 24 seven, more or less, we have around 1000 hours sunlight a year. We have a very interesting resource in tidal energy, the tidal streams in between the islands. And then finally, we have a lot of rain. 1300 millimeters in average, but uh, in various places exceeding 3000 millimeters. So these are the four pillars we are building our green strategy on. If you look at the complementary of the resources, we see that we have a lot of wind and rain in the winter months, but definitely not so much in the summer. Actually, we are lacking wind and, and, and hydro in the summer months. But that is exactly when we have the sun. 
Normally we say that if you ha should have a summer holiday in the Faroe Islands, you should choose May because that is where we have the most uh, sold uh, TV hours. And then we have tidal streams, which is not linked to the weather, only linked to the phase of the moon. And we know, normally we say 100 years ahead, exactly when we have the tides. Knowing that it's going six hours in one direction and then six hours in the other direction, but we know exactly when it's there. If we, yeah, a few words about the, the company, the energy company in the Faroe Islands called SEV. It is a non-profit company founded back in 1946. It's 100% owned by all the Faroe's municipality, and it is a virtually integrated company, meaning that we produce the energy, we transmit it, we distribute it, and we sell it to the end customers. Uh, we have a joint and several price structures, so even if you live on some of the smaller islands, which, which are not connected to the main islands, you pay the same amount per kilowatt hour. Uh, the main grid, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but the main grid is, uh, is uh, uh, approximately 90% of the, uh, of the uh, consumption uh, is connected all together. Then we have an island up south, Suvoroi, which is 10%. Then we have five small islands running, running with diesel gensets on the road. Um, Perry, we have a question in the comments, if I can read it for you. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, Jeannie, who has presented earlier, uh, she has she's asking uh, if you can say what is the industry expansion um, that seems to account for a great deal of the yellow band in the demand graph you showed earlier and transport uh, with EV is that public transport or residential and fleet electrification that is fleet electrification personal vehicles uh, we are uh, taking into account and buses as well uh, but we don't have that many buses uh, the yellow uh, and, and we say industry, that is new industry, and it is predominantly salmon farming industry. We have a lot of salmon farming here in the islands, so that is in particular uh, salmon farming. And uh, maybe just one thing to um, take into account during presentation, as we've been discussing um, the existence of the regulator and the role of the regulator, if you, I don't know if that's uh, already involved in your presentation, but if you could comment on that. Um, what is their role and how are they affecting, let's say, the changes that are happening in uh, Faroe Islands? Yeah, uh, maybe we can address that uh, finally in the presentation. Okay. Um, yeah, we have a monopoly on grid operation and then we have a de facto monopoly on production as we produce 98% in-house. I'm not going into details, but this is a small, uh, small uh, power system with a peak demand of 70 megawatts, and we produce last year 434 gigawatt hours, seven isolated grids. And what is of interest is obviously the fact that we are electrically isolated from neighboring countries, so there's no cables to Denmark, to Norway, or Iceland. Some of the renewable energy projects we have been looking into um, and which are currently um, in operation. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have uh, seven Enercon turbines installed back in 2020 in the island of Suvoroi, which I'll address later on as well. Then we have in Hoibuse in 2022, 25 megawatt with six uh, Vestas turbines. And in the lower right corner, there's six Enercon E82 um, turbines installed back in 2020 as well. So actually, we tripled the, the wind energy uh, in, in one year in, in the Faroes. We have a, a, a really good understanding of where we're going to install wind turbines uh, in the upcoming years. Uh, we, our ambition is to spread the wind uh, farms around the islands in order to not... Uh, have the wind, same wind regime uh, for all wind turbines. Um, we spend quite some time on PV as well. Uh, we don't have that many flat areas in the islands, so we are looking into mostly into solar uh, uh, rooftop uh, PV, 
but we are also looking into floating solar in the reservoirs where we are operating hydro turbines already. Uh, and one may be um, not so um, uh, normal way of collecting water. This is the, the biggest reservoir that we are using for hydropower in the Fair Islands. It's containing 15 million cubic meters. But in that island, you see here the, the reservoir, but in this island we have drilled a tunnel system of approximately 30 kilometers in the mountainside where we collect water from the whole island. And this is the, the way we do it. We have some, some concrete and then the water is, is uh, yeah, running down to the tunnel and, and up to the reservoir. Um, currently, we are in, in a, 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 a cooperation with a Swedish company called Minesto in order to um, yeah, look into how we could harvest tidal energy. This is a really interesting project. Um, the fact is that we have a lot, yeah, a lot of tidal streams in between the islands. And what is of interest is that there is a time-wise phase shift in between the different sites. You will see in the, in the graph here that we have measurements from three different sites. You can imagine if we can install turbines in all these three sites, we would have like what we normally say a base load generation for tidal energy. And in the lower part, we see uh, on the right hand side, we see the um, two uh, old or older kites that have been in operation. And on the left hand side, we have seen the more uh, upgraded uh, version that are currently in, in one of the straits uh, currently. Uh, and the principle is like this. We have this kite flying in a figure of eight, and it is tethered to the seabed. And uh, the reason why it's flying in a figure of eight is to, is to um, increase the speed of the tide that the rotor in the front of the, of the, of the kite is experiencing. Um, so whenever the, the tides are going, or, or to put it in another way, the... Uh, Tidal speed that the kite is experiencing is eight to 10 times higher than the current kite. And that's why it's running in this figure of eight. Um, this is only a, a, this picture here. This is in Vesmana on the left-hand upper uh, corner. You see the Vesmana village uh, in the picture and this boat is tow towing the kite out to the, up to the side. And on the right-hand side upper, Right hand side, you see the kite, the new kite arrived in this area, Vesmana, only two weeks ago. It's a kite of 1.2 megawatt that will be deployed within the next couple of weeks. So we are very excited about this project. And Vinesto have uh, looked into what is the potential in the Faroe Islands, and we are able to install at least 200 megawatt of tidal uh, technologies in, in between the different uh, islands. When talking about energy storage, we normally say we have uh, battery energy storage online in the Faroes, uh, dealing with um, variation in seconds, minutes, and hours. And then when we look into hours, days, and weeks, we look into pumped hydro. Uh, and we are planning a pumped hydro and, um, and uh, if everything goes as planned, uh, a big, in our terms at least, big high pump title will be in, in, uh, in operation in 2028. Uh, a picture of a battery station uh, that will be actually inaugurated uh, on Friday, this Friday, uh, where we normally install a synchronous condenser and a battery system. The synchronous condenser is there to provide the uh, ancillary services needed when we shut off the diesel gen sets in terms of uh, inertia and short circuit capabilities. And the batteries on the right upper hand will be more for stabilizing the, uh, the variability in the wind, uh, wind power output. It is by far the largest battery system in the Danish kingdom, uh, currently at least. And we have really good results from the island of South that I will address a bit later on. In terms of pumped hydro, this is the area. We have two natural, not natural, but yeah, natural reservoirs, I say. 
uh, in, in place already. And um, our ambition is to have a, a pump hydro powerhouse in the mountainside, not uh, or hidden from the eye. You will not see it. The only thing you will see actually in the is the portal where we're gonna have all the um, yeah machine machine houses 800 meters inside the mountain. That is the only thing you will see with your eyes, except the fact that uh, there will be uh, uh, a bit more dynamic level in the in the reservoirs when, when the pumped hydro is in operation. Um, when looking into renewables and grid stability. Uh, obviously, when installing inverter-based uh, generation, we will see a decreased inertia and we will see a decreased short circuit power in the in the in the power system. That need to be addressed in, in some way or another in order to to, to uh, for our customers to have the needed quality of supply. For that, we have used the, the island up south, Suuroi, as a laboratory to us. The average load in this island is four megawatts, but there is a big fish factory in the island. And when it's running, we have a load of eight megawatts. But in the weekends, we typically have a, a load less than two megawatts. These are the different assets. We have these seven Enercon turbines in place. We have a really old uh, hydropower plant uh, originating back to 1921 in the left upper corner. And in the lower right corner, we have this in, in, in our terms, the biggest PV plant in the island. It is uh, situated on an abandoned foot, football pitch. You can see maybe the artificial grass beneath. Mm -hmm. It was not in use anymore, so we were offered to use the, the, the site for, for PV panels. And then on the left-hand side, we have the power plant. Um, what we saw when we installed the wind uh, in this island, which is isolated, that the, the frequency distribution was much worse after installing the wind alone, you can see that in blue, which is the frequency distribution after the wind farm was installed. So we knew that we need to address this and, and come up with some measures in order to, to, to uh, increase the, the frequency and stability of the system. And to do that, we installed a battery and a synchronous condenser. Here we have some pictures from, from the side. The left upper corner, this is the synchronous condenser and on the left, Lower corner is the battery. It is a 6.3 megawatt battery, which is comparable to the wind, which is 6.3 as well. So in this island, we can run on wind alone, and we have proven that that is possible. And uh, the wind or the battery is so big that even if we lose the wind for half an hour, maybe up to one hour, we can supply the whole island only with batteries and the synchronous condenser. And uh, in this year, we have run 118 uh, days, 100% green in the island. And just to prove that this is right, uh, this is a picture from the island. We have on the left-hand side from our homepage is that we can see that we're running 100% wind, unfortunately only in fairways. Uh, we have oil, we have hydro, we have biogas, and we have solar power, but this is showing only 100% wind. On the top, we have the frequency, which is stable throughout uh, these hours. Then just a question. Can you see my mouse? Yeah. OK. So here we are shutting down the diesel gen sets. And a few hours later, we are shutting down the hydropower plant as well. So now we are running only on wind. But unfortunately, the wind dropped uh, at 13.45, you must say. But you see here in purple that the battery injected power. So this, so we were running on battery alone for for quite some time as well. Dergi, who owns the the system? Is it one utility on the whole island? Yes, one okay. utility on the whole island, and we own all the assets. We have yeah. we have three different uh, wind power private wind power companies that inject power to the system as well. But they are obliged to sell all their energy to the utility. Yeah. Uh, here we have a picture when um, we are running uh, on, on wind alone on the island. You can see wind power and uh, the frequency is, is quite stable, uh, at least in, in our system. Yeah. But then suddenly we had a drop in the wind very uh, in only a few seconds. We lost 100% of the wind. 
but you will see in blue that the, the battery injected power and then we were running on more or less battery for for quite some time and the only distrib or, or disturbance you see is is a frequency distribution frequency disturbance of, of 0.2 hertz which is definitely okay uh, to us yeah and just to, to see one more time that the, the battery is really uh, making yes. uh, the frequency better is that one day we had to do some maintenance of the battery so we had to sh uh, switch it off and then the frequency went you know crazy for for that day when uh, when when uh, working on the battery and then at the 1600 hours we switched on the battery again and the frequency went quite stable and here we can see that after the installation of the synchronous condenser and the battery, the frequency distribution curve is much better than it was prior to the wind farm. Yeah. And these uh, are, again, pictures from our homepage, which, which is very normal in the island of Suvore that we run 100% uh, green uh, here for, for, for a week, Monday to Sunday. And uh, in green, we have the wind. In yellow is the sun on top. And then we have some hydropower as well. So we have put quite some effort into uh, setting up uh, a, a tangible roadmap toward 2030. And uh, we are uh, going to install uh, four more wind or five more wind farms in the upcoming years. We are installing quite some, some solar uh, as well. And the pump hydro in 2028. And uh, with this, we will be 92% green in 2030. But when installing quite a lot of wind in, in, in the system, we have a lot of excess renewable energy. And uh, what we are looking into is to produce some green fuel uh, to supply the rest, uh, the remaining 8%. And, and uh, most likely uh, it will be ammonia because we don't have any CO2 emitters in the ferros. So, so most likely the eight remaining percent will, will be, um, be from, from uh, our fuel fuel engines at the power plants running on ammonia. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the final two slides from my side is that um, we have to look beyond 2030 as well. And when trans taken, um, if we look into 2040, like we do in this, uh, this slides, and we take into consideration that the, the, the fleet, I mean, the, the, the shipping industry uh, need to change as well to some green fuel. Uh, we have made some projections here that uh, taken into account that approximately half of the ferries vessels are fueled with green ammonia. Then we we'll need to have more than or need to produce more than three terawatt hours. And we do definitely not be able to do that with wind on onshore because we don't have that much uh, land available. That's why we have been looking into a a potential offshore wind farm uh, east of the Faroes, a big scale, two gigawatts. And, uh, and one of the main um, uh, economic incentive would be maybe to export green energy to Scotland or to Shetland or maybe to the oil fields nearby. Yeah. So well, that was um, uh, okay. really fast. Uh, some of the things we are looking into, uh, and I would be happy to take some of the questions. Of yeah, Terry, um, I really liked it. I uh, would have loved to have you indeed uh, also in the, in the session last week. Um, but coming back a bit to the topic of today. Um, so you, I mean, there's one utility that also supplies all the energy. Who ensures that you're working in the most cost efficient way and that the tariff setting towards the end consumers is hand as, let's say, target it and, and, and as, as sharp as possible? We have a, a electricity authority or a regulator, uh, which, yeah. are, which are looking into all the investments we do and making sure that we, um, we, um, we operate as efficient as possible. Yeah. And, uh, and um, they, they always have to, um, um, they always have to say yes. When we uh, normally, when we look into what investments should we have for the next years or next year and 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 uh, then we set the price for the next year yeah and before setting the price we have to negotiate with the authority whether it's okay or not and very often they say oh you you have to you have to you're not able to 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 put so much on you have to lower the the increase maybe or 
yeah. there is a, a regulator uh, in, in the picture as well. Yeah, okay. Any questions from the audience? Don't have any questions in the chat, but uh, um, I don't know, Ginny, since we have you with us, if you wanted to comment anything on this and maybe make the connection with what we've heard earlier. Yeah, I, I just one of the things that that struck me as well is is one thing that our utility, uh, sorry, our regulator does is they step in when the market isn't working. If your market's working, you don't really have the same needs as as you know if the market isn't working. So in the case of Faro, I, I, I'm just looking at this going, well, your utility seems to be of a very different mindset. You're you're making the the transition into renewable energy, and and maybe this is more of a question: Are you making that? Um, um, transition to renewable energy more of 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 your own volition as a um as a utility or is this something that you're being forced to do i mean why why are you making the the transition to renewable energy i mean for me the the reasons are obvious but but maybe could you talk a little bit about that definitely in in back in 2014 uh, cf as utility announced this green vision we, we call it normally 100 by 2030, um, saying that by 2030, all electricity onshore should be green or coming from renewable energy. And in actually in the coalition agreement uh, in 2015, it was positively stated in the coalition agreement that by 2030, we will be green onshore in electricity. So they ac actually took it uh, and, and incorporated into the coalition agreement. And ever since, I would say, there will be a very good common understanding of the politics and, and the utility heading in the same direction. Uh, so that has been really good. And, and I, I would say one, there's, it is, the, the, the vision is based on you know, two-folded, um, uh, the, 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 um, the, I would say the positive outcome. First of all, we can, we can lower the emission by having green energy. But to us, it's even cheaper than 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 oil. So so it is it's really a, a no-brainer to us to go this this road toward 2030. Huh? We we have to import really expensive oil. What is of interest is that we can produce one kilowatt hour with wind and batteries and synchronous condenser cheaper than oil. Mm. So it's yeah, really a, a, a yeah. good uh, good business case for us to. Um, yeah. Um, and, but, and sorry, so, I was just going to say, and for us, that's a really important thing to keep in mind is, is mm -hmm. the regulator also can keep the utility honest. And right now our utility, not saying they're dishonest necessarily, but they, they sing the song of the cheapest way for us to make electricity still is going to be fossil fuels. If not in heavy fuel oil, then we need to switch to liquefied natural gas because that is going to be the cheapest mm -hmm. thing. So it's up to our re regulator to be able to call that and say, well, yeah. we don't think so. Yeah. Um, there are a few. Yeah. yeah, there's two questions in the chat and I just want to address them. Uh, that is, that's okay. The first one is from Janet Lawrence and she asks, is the regulatory authority alert a relatively new venture or has it been in place since the onset of your renewable energy projects and reforms? It has been uh, it has been there for, for quite some years, uh, and and actually it was there uh, prior to the vision set out by Seo, mm -hmm. but but at that point in time the vision was only to become more green, not we had we didn't have any target as such uh, at that point in time, but uh, but after Seo announced this vision in two thousand fourteen, we 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 um, really um, uh, shared our forces toward the same goal. I think yeah. that is that is really important that that the political system, uh, the utility, and the authorities, everybody is working in the same direction. I think that is very beneficial, at least here in, in the Faroes. Yes, and and we have a, a second question, which is more technical. Yeah, so it's a bit of diving into the technical aspects that you were showing in your presentation, as you were showing how better, let's say the frequency fluctuations or how less the frequency fluctuations are once you have the battery systems. But there is a question of um, how does the fluctuation in, in the frequency before the batteries affect the sensitive equipment? And 
Is this something that you had to deal with, I guess? Yeah. Um, that, is, that is really a good um, question because during this uh, process uh, and recently we, we had a PhD student on this uh, matter yeah. as well. And the question, she was linked to Aalborg University in Denmark and the Ferris University as well. And one of the questions was, how bad is it for a, a, an isolated power system that the frequency is fluctuating a bit? Huh? And, mm -hmm. and it's really problematic or difficult to come up with a fixed number. Uh, so we, but, but we said we would like to have the frequency maybe better, but at least not worse than it was before we installed wind power. Then we we should be okay, yeah. But what seems to be really good that it that the frequency and 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 the stability of the power system is is much better with the with the synchronous compressor and the batteries installed. Yeah. We have been really happy with the, with these systems uh, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so well, sorry, I'm not able to 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 say exactly numbers because we don't have fixed numbers. But yeah. but, uh, but 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 again, our our ambition was that we should have a system that was not worse than it was before yeah, so... erecting the turbines. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thierry, for uh, for your presentation. It was very interesting and uh, and very detailed in in certain yeah. aspects. As we saw also this transition from our discussion from last week from the policy to strategy, action plan, roadmap to the actions and and to the solution. <laughs> Jeannie, yeah. that's really nicely said. <laughs> Pick his brains. <laughs> yeah, we will make sure that uh, Therese's ther ther details will be shared. Yeah, and uh, Jeannie, thank you for joining us. Uh, at this point, I would like to say, as we are, uh, we have reached our, let's say, time limit here, yeah, uh, as it's um, a time to close the, the training. However, uh, there is a question, so... Um, first, to thank our speakers and to thank you all for your time. Uh, there is still aspects of, let's say, um, the training part, let's say, on what the, the regulators are doing and how they do this, that uh, is in Len's presentation that has not been addressed, yeah, because we we were discussing and, mm -hmm. and it was a good discussion, but we did not have time for this. So maybe a question there is, um, because the, uh, this uh, training is recorded, the question is, if you want you could stay and Len could finish yep. the presentation um and then if you cannot stay of course uh you're you're welcome to leave as if, if you have other obligations but it would be good maybe to have that uh for the next maybe 10 minutes Len is that okay yeah yeah uh, you have that on the recording so with this first I thank you all and thank you for joining us and then uh thank you uh thank to our thanks to our speakers as well um, and then maybe, Len, uh, you can take over from here, yeah? Yeah, can you share the slides? Um, so, Terry, um, I think Sarah has your contact details, so um, we'll make sure that that is shared. Um, um, so, Jeannie, thanks also. Um, so, uh, we were at setting up a regulator. We've heard a lot of things about it. Um, so I can go rather fast. However, if you think I'm going too fast, then just hold me back. Um, we're at slide 20, oh, I think. Yes. yes, thank you. Next one. Yep. There we go. Voila. So a regulator, um, what we said earlier, needs appropriate resources, an adequate legal mandate, and clear values and operating procedures. These procedures are super important because he's going to overview what others do and their procedures. So being transparent about it is super, super important. So before you start setting it up, um, you typically talk to different stakeholders. You discuss the legal aspect, the values, and the resources. So next slide, please. And the legal mandate really means what are the functions. What Jeannie already said, huh? we first started with that, and then you can add things as you move on. Um, you have to make sure that it is clearly distinct from what the policy level does, um, which I think was, was shown also. Um, and that together, of course, you cover all the relevant aspects. That, that Because you're transferring stuff from a policy level to a regulatory level, there is no vague uh, open left. Um, so you really have to make sure it's all encompassing. Think about the monitoring and the evaluation. 
how are you going to assess whether you're whether you're uh, newly initiated or your adjusted uh, regulator is actually doing the job as you agreed? Uh, performance indicators could be linked to, um, you know, the number of complaints, um, the increase in efficiency uh, in, in the utility, these kind of things. And you need to know what we said last week also with uh, the KPIs, how you're going to monitoring. Also, what are the actions following such assessment? Then for the values, um, you need to make sure that that independence, which is one of the key values, is translated in structures and procedures. So how are you going to measure a thing like independence? How will procedures be developed that guarantee the transparency? Uh, I said earlier, the annual report, definitely something you could do, but think also about the tenders um, that you're going to do and how you're going to communicate about them. How do you assure that, or how do you guarantee um, that you have access to all the information that you need to do your job as a regulator? Is there maybe some policy missing that grants you access to certain things? And then the tools and procedures, um, the juridical steps uh, that you can take as a um, uh, regulator to ensure that you can do the jobs and guarantee the values such as consumer and investor protection. These rules have also to be embedded in the legal uh, mandate that you have. And that's what we said earlier in the first two to three years, it's probably going to be needing some external funding, regulatory funding. Um, but make sure that even with that circumstance, you are able to operate independently. Also, who decides on the needed resources? You know, you are asking everyone to be efficient. Now, who's going to decide on what you need and how is that measured? Uh, who's going to decide on how much staff you need? So these are your resources. And in order to be independent, but especially transparent, um, and, you know, the authority that creates confidence, that aspect is super important on who defines what you can spend. Um, what was said earlier, Ed, don't start full blown. You have to gradually develop what you wanna do and see how you're gonna do that. So first focus is I think also what Jeannie said, Ed, what is burning? You're addressing something that is burning and that is the first thing you're gonna do as a regulator. Apply learning by doing. So take a bit of time to develop your procedures as you're trying to address these aspects. Be clear about your work in the domain. So clearly say, this is fancy. Say, this is what I'm doing. And this is currently outside of the scope. It might be super interesting, but at this stage, no, we're saying no to that one. Keep it on the list though for your next round of negotiations where you say, okay, this is clearly something that people ask us to pick up. Um, yeah, and this, for this one, uh, of course, uh, the regulator needs sufficient legal authority to, to be able to deliver what he needs to deliver. Next one. Then their values and principles. We said earlier communication. Make sure that everything you do is available to stakeholders on a timely and accessible basis. Basis. And that's not an easy thing to do. Just to give you an idea, when we did the assessment of how tariffs were built up in all European countries, it was super difficult to just find something that would detail it completely. It took us ages to put together the pieces and then in the end ask them whether this was complete. So just be transparent about it. What, what uh, was said earlier, I don't know by whom, is uh, people want to know what is included in, in the tariff. That is a super important thing. Consultation was said earlier, especially if you change, for example, the way you're setting up the tariff, the tariff methodology. It's super important to give people, to give stakeholders the time to come back to you. What I said earlier, between four and 12 weeks is what you would typically have for a consultation for all stakeholders to be able to get back to you with their point of view. Next one, consistency. Um, what was said earlier, right? you want to give that confidence to the market, but also to the consumers. So consistency in how you take decisions, how you motivate them, that is super important. Next one, predictability. Um, that is also super important. Um, it reduces a risk if I know how if I can somehow predict how you're going to act, say, if you at a certain moment give a massive amount of subsidies to bring in a technology like on Faroe Island, say, the Minesto wave energy, then I can predict 
if I'm a bit in a business that that subsidy is not going to take a long time, that within five, 10 years, it's not going to be there anymore. So that predictability is super important. Flexibility, um, you're addressing emergencies in a, and other things in a changing market. So you need to have the appropriate instruments in response to changing conditions. That won't be the case if you start. But as you go along, you need to establish that relationship with the minister and to say, okay, acute issues, how do we address that? Can we set up a standard procedure for it? Next one. Independence, what we said earlier, huh? make sure that you can work with no influence from whether it's the government or a main, what, what Jeannie said, huh? one of the main suppliers on the island. You have to be able to work independently from that. And that is super important from the start, because otherwise your credibility is gone from the start. Next one. That is super important. And it's the thing that I said on the, uh, some of the previous slides. Um, if you are not an example in that, uh, effectiveness and efficiency, then again, you lose your credibility. So it's not only in your operation, you're also pushing, of course, others to be effective and efficient, but you have to be an example on that as well. Accountability, um, just make sure that everything you do is well justified and that you could be defended. If someone comes to ask for an appeal, that you are clear and say, okay, based on these rules, um, that um, this is what we're gonna go, I mean, this is what our decision was based on. Transparency, what we said earlier, had this is super important for your legitimacy, but also think about transparency is something you create with communication, which Jeannie also said, we clearly communicated, we're still communicating and they're already in business for a couple of years, but transparency is also easy access to information. Just make sure your website is you know, children proof in Norway, they use a 14 year old kit to assess whether the information they provide and the way it is provided is accessible because a 14 year old kit, if they can get it, anyone can get it. That's the process they apply and it actually works. Next one. Very briefly going over this, there are different organizational structures and there are actually two different ones that you could say okay it's either the one or the other or it's anything in between them so here you see typically when it's smaller you have a chairman with a number of commissioners an executive director and different departments that's an easy way to do it very easy on decision making your executive uh, director is doing the daily business or the alternative is on the next slide this is where you're already more established and where you have a chairman that works with commissioners that each are um, responsible for a department. You see this structure is more complex and has more room to, um, yeah, to work independently in the different departments. So it's already when the departments have clear and you know a more heavy workload um, that you move to this one. Anything in between can work as well. Moving to, indeed, the last element. I'm rushing a bit, so if I'm going too fast, just hold me back. Um, building a credibly uh, regulatory arrangement, there are two super important things in this. And that is communication and evaluating the regulatory system. Communication is also what Jeannie said. It's super important to say what you're going to do. It needs to be bidirectional. That means that I, as a consumer, need to be able to somehow get in touch with you. Me, as a supplier, need the same way to get access to you as Lucia, as a supplier. So that communication needs to be uh, bidirectional, but also linked to that non-discriminatory. That is whether whoever I am, whether I'm coming from on the island or from somewhere else, I need to get the same access with the same um, with the same procedures. Then the next thing is it should be um, any of that communication should not influence my job as a regulator, but inform me about stakeholders views and stakeholders could be anything like consumers, energy companies, utilities and governments. And if you take that very openly, then it is known that you could call it lobbying, but if all the parties lobbied, it increases knowledge of you as a regulator. So have them. And if only three out of the four are coming to talk to you, then go out and talk to the fourth one. Um, 
then clear communication channels with standard procedures. That's super important as well. Are you always communicating to your website in a local magazine? And that might include what Jeannie Oslo said, TV and radio communication, adverts in local newspapers, articles. You want to reach out to the people and not to the ones that might find your website or might know the way to your local social media channel. But you want to reach out to everyone, especially if you're setting up your regulatory arrangements, your regulation for the first time. So make sure that you reach out to everyone. That's a super important aspect. And then the next thing is you want to evaluate your regulatory system on a regular basis. Um, so that means that from the design onwards, you need to think about how am I going to do that? One of the things that could work in the beginning, something very simple, is a scorecard, which could say, you know, extent to which regulatory decisions are published, or even a bit, string, a bit more stringent, published within a certain time frame. The speed at which the regulator makes decisions, is that within what you had envisaged, or is it really too slow? The ability of the regulator to procure external independent advice when required, is that a long procedure, and does it influence your work? Could we make it shorter? Does it lead to the quality of the external advice that you need? The, the quality of the chief, chief executive um, of the regulatory agency, is he up to his job? Does he need additional training? Do you see he's struggling with certain things? The rate of staff turnover, which is super important because that means that either the environment is not, uh, not good or the workload is either too high or too low. They don't find they have the tools. So when you see a high rate of staff turnover, it's definitely time to do an exit talk to them and ask them what exactly holds you back from staying here and building this regulation activity. Voila. Sorry to have rushed it a bit. We can come back to it either tomorrow or uh, the day after. Um, and if needed, we can always organize a next session. Is there anything that you still need to know? So all the slides will be made There's available. A lot of information, yeah, provided today. So I think that uh, it's it's possible that there is no more questions. Um, and I would like to thank you all for for staying for additional time. Uh, we we're happy we have recorded this so that people that also had to leave or were not here that they can also check it out and and get this information. Um, with that, I thank you all for your participation, for your questions, and I hope that this was a very mm -hmm useful session, uh, especially for uh, looking into how to set up the regulator and what are the aspects that they can do and how to improve their Thank operations. You. Thank you so much. So we see, oh, we have four messages. Am I missing something here? They're thanking and <laughs> okay, guys. Mm -hmm. saying that the session was very useful, yes. So okay. uh, more tomorrow. And then we end the week with an adventure from our side on implementing the first Belgian neighborhood battery. Um, so looking forward to see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you. See you then. Thank bye you. bye. See you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye. Goodbye. Okay. Bye bye. That was that. Um, Laura, could you um, remove Jeannie and Kishena and Nikim, Nikima? Okay, voila, Jean Baptiste. Hello, good evening. <laughs>